Hello, folks. Welcome. It's uh, our regular Tuesday chat series now uh, called NDN Talks. I'm Simon Rosenberg. I've got Karen Kornblue with me here, uh, my dear old friend. And um, as people are uh, getting on, you know, logging in or whatever we call it, joining the conversation, uh, let me start by saying this is a new regular live Tuesday at one o'clock p.m. Eastern time event. We've been now doing it for a couple months. Uh, been pleased with what we've been able to do. And the theory of these events are, you know, a single subject with a single person where we do a deep dive for 30 to 40 minutes um, and spend, uh, you know, and have the luxury of being able to go into a major important issue facing the country in depth uh, in a time of memes and tweets and all the things that go on, the ability to really drill down on something over in depth is really a luxury. And if you have time to be able to share with us, we're really glad you're here because we think these have been illuminating discussions about really the big issues of the day. Um, and I've been pleased so far with the, you know, both with the turnout we've been getting and also with um, the quality of the discussions we've had. So I think it's a successful format and we're gonna continue to do it in the, in the coming months. And today we have uh, an old collaborator and I will say, <laughs> hopefully you can't hear, there's incredible construction happening on two houses right outside of my house. And so you may, some of that may bleed into the audio today, but I'm, I'm joined today uh, with a dear old friend, Karen Kornblue, former ambassador of the OECD, a veteran of both the Clinton and Obama administration. She's also spent some time in the private sector, which is relevant for the discussion today as an economic consultant and also at the Nielsen Corporation headquartered in Wilton, Connecticut, my home town. Um, and, and what's important about Karen, and, and since we've known each other all the way back in the 90s, is that Karen has been a consistent thought leader in the digital space since there was a digital space uh, back in the 1990s. And I think she and I were definitely part of the uh, internet utopian crowd um, who are now just, you know, chastened uh, by what's happened and working diligently to try to repair uh, the broken information ecosystem that exists here and around the world. It's an urgent challenge and that's what she's gonna be spending time talking to us about today. So Karen, welcome. And I'm really just gonna turn it to you. I mean, you've been writing so much. You've been conducting this wonderful program at the, at the German Marshall Fund, looking into what you call the debilitating information disorder. Um, give us your thoughts, share with us, what's the problem? What do we need to do? Thanks so much, Simon. Um, I really uh, am so grateful for you to you for including me in this because you bring together you know, such thoughtful people and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Um, I'm gonna pick up on not the fact that you used the word old three times in introducing me, <laughs> <laughs> but the that. other part of the introduction where you talked about how we've been talking about digital issues for so long. And that's where I come at this. Um, you know, I've been working on, uh, as Simon said, on digital issues since the commercialization of the internet, a big believer in the internet. And we had did have this utopian idea that by its very design, the very technology was going to enhance democracy. That because it was this end-to-end -end permissionless structure, um, it would lead to increase in free expression and increase in, um, uh, you know, political activism. And in many, many ways it has, it has changed the world. I mean, if we look at Black Lives Matter and Me Too and, you know, so many other ways in which people have gotten engaged, it has been that. But after the Russian interference in the election in 2016, I really wanted to take a step back and say, is the policy framework that we put in place back in the 90s when this was an infant industry, when it was really seen as providing necessary competition to these ex existing telecom network, you know, was there something wrong with that? Did we make a big mistake? Were we wrong about the internet to be so optimistic about it? Uh, or is it something else? And so that's what I wanna talk about a little bit today is, you know, I don't wanna throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I, I think we have to watch out for how we describe the problem of misinformation and disinformation. So we understand what it is and we think of some common sense repairing, as Simon said, repairing uh, steps um, instead of destructive steps. So um, uh, I'm gonna start with January 6th. I think what January 6th really shows us is that the current strategy is not working. And I would describe the current uh, strategy that many people use this term, whack-a-mole, is just not working. 
we cannot just focus on the individual pieces of content and say, who's going to play the truth police about whether this is true or false and what's the you know, danger to free expression and so on and so forth. And, and I'll, you know, a, a, a big example for me of what's wrong with the whack-a-mole approach is there was this um, video, Breitbart video uh, called America's Frontline Doctors. And it's a 40 minute video and it was all these conspiracy theories about, you know, Fauci and, and treatments for COVID and masks are bad for you. And in the 12 hours it was online on all the major platforms, it garnered over 14 million uh, interactions. And then all the platforms took it down because it clearly violated all of their policies. But it takes that long to evaluate a single piece of content and they let their amplification machines operate the whole time and it takes you have to watch it for 40 minutes the moderators and the fact checkers then they debate whether or not it actually violates their rules and then they finally decide they run it up the ladder and then they take action that obviously cannot be the way we approach things so so what's the alternative um uh well we i don't think we have to do it this way if we look past the individual piece of content and how it travels across social media how it becomes popular what we can see is that there's a pipeline. There's a real pipeline of disinformation that takes an individual piece of content that the people who study this stuff call misinformation, because it might not be purposeful and it might not be that dangerous in and of itself. And it gets pumped through this pipeline that exists sort of on top of the platforms, in the platforms. And by the time it gets out, it has hundreds of thousands, if not millions of views and shares. And it's, it's this system creates disinformation, which is the strategic deployment of misinformation to deceive people. So we had an example of this. We were studying what happened with this whole conspiracy around the Texas uh, power outages and this conspiracy theory about the windmills. And a lot of people were saying, how did this ha happen so fast? How did this conspiracy theory get spun up so quickly that it was the Green New Deal and windmills that caused the power outages. And so I'm just gonna walk you through, you know, start to finish what we saw about how this pipeline works. So it starts on February 13th, and there's a tweet that shows helicopters de-icing wind turbines that it's posted on Twitter. Um, the image is from Sweden in 2014. Uh, it doesn't get that many retweets. It doesn't get seen by that many people. On February 14th, there's an article in a reputable outlet called the Austin American Statesman that talks about frozen wind turbines contributing to the problem. But then the next day, Breitbart jumps on it. And there's a, an article linking to the American Statesman, but distorting what it said and saying wind turbines are responsible. 79,000 Facebook interactions. Another disinformation site, same day, Texas Scorecard, claims Texans aren't just feeling the consequences of frozen turbines, they're also subsidizing them. 73,000 interactions. The Daily Wire jumps in. They link to the American statement, statesman. 262,000 interactions. Guess who gets involved? Tucker Carlson. He makes a claim on Fox. The foxnews.com link to his monologue, 283,000 interactions. And then the YouTube video, 617,000. Next day, Western Journal, another one of these uh, disinformation outlets, summarizes Carlson's argument, includes links to the tweet, the original tweet of the helicopter de-icing the, the wind turbines from Sweden in 2014. Hundreds of thousands of Facebook interactions. More influencers jump in. Um, uh, Dan Crenshaw, Greg Abbott, appears on the Sean Hannity show. Um, YouTube video, 191,000 views, and so on and so on. And so you can see how these outlets that have enormous audiences that they build up beforehand through ads, through networks of pages, um, then, they, then the, in, the content gets pumped out through pages, through influencers, groups sit on the platforms and you know, when the occasion strikes, if a disinformation campaign gets started, it can pump out the misinformation to reach millions and millions of people. And then the, the uh, algorithm that we've all heard of takes effect. It says, this is popular, this is incendiary, 
it pumps it out more. Individuals share it, gets shared in these groups and so on. And the result just isn't a fair fight between truth and disinformation. Um, we identified a set of pages promoting health misinformation outlets that had 37 million interactions, more than the WHO and the CDC combined. Uh, it was taken down, but it wasn't taken down because it had disinformation. It was taken down because it was coordinating in an inauthentic way, and that breaks Facebook rules. So that brings me to the last point, which is, why don't the platforms go after this pipeline when they're repeat offenders, they're super spreaders? And they are starting to, and that's a really good news. Um, but it's been, it's been tough and it's been tough on them for two reasons. One is, look, they have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders and this keeps eyeballs on the platform. So there's a financial disincentive. And then there's a political, there's political pressure because every time they try to make a real effort on this, they get accused of bias. And in fact, there are not only members of Congress that are accusing them of bias, but in states, uh, they're passing laws or they're trying to pass laws that would punish the platforms for doing any platform moderation. So we have three steps and I'll just go over them real quick. And then if anybody's interested, we can answer them in the Q&A. Um, we've recommended three, what we hope are pretty common sense solutions uh, that hopefully don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but mend it, don't end it. Um, uh, there's a phrase, Simon. Um, and uh, so three, one is, uh, change the incentives of the platforms and those of the conspiracy mongers by taking some basic offline rights and protections that we have and just enforcing them online. And so what do I mean? I mean, consumer fraud, voter suppression, campaign finance, uh, target harassment, civil rights violations, incitement. These are all we enforce against those offline. We need to figure out how to enforce against them online. Sometimes the regulators and DOJ already have the authority. In some cases, we need to tweak the law. So the Honest Ads Act is a great example of this bipartisan bill um, that would just update the uh, disclosure rules that we have on broadcast for online. But we need to do that with a whole bunch of other stuff, I'd say starting with civil rights. And there are a bunch of bills in Congress right now on this. Um, we need some kind of, or the platforms need some kind of enforceable code uh, to take the pressure off themselves, to sort of handcuff themselves so that when they're under political pressure, they say, look, we have these rules. Here's how we've said we're going to enforce them. Here's how we enforce them. We're not doing anything that's biased. And that could be things like having a lot of transparency, using a bunch of tactics that my colleague calls friction uh, to slow the spread. You know, we should have some kind of circuit breaker for when something like that Americans Frontline Doctors is starting to go viral. Just have a circuit breaker. Don't take it down, but don't keep amplifying it. Don't let it keep spreading while you're evaluating it. A bunch of tactics like that. And then the third thing is we need to figure out how to amplify the authoritative voices. How do we make it a fair fight so that the WHO and the CDC and uh, climate scientists and election officials that they have a distribution mechanism. So we have to have some kind of non-deceptive pipeline that helps amplify those authoritative voices. And we've called that for want of a better term, a PBS of the internet. Um, but we have to think about how to do that in a way that doesn't have the government getting involved in, again, picking what's true or what's false. So those are some of the ideas that we have. Um, and it's in this context of, you know, let's deal with this very serious problem that's just that's undermining our democracy, hurting public health, hurting our understanding of the climate situation, uh, dangerous to elections. But let's do it in a way that preserves what's good about the Internet. Thanks, Karen. I, I, I do think that this idea that the Internet is one of the most remarkable things in human history um, but it's hitting a choppy period where we need like a house that's needs a little bit of an upgrade, right? We've got to attend to it uh, across many domains here, right? It's not just this, but it's also the cybersecurity piece, which is becoming even more, ever more grave. Um, you know, in, in the U.S., I think this is going to be a really major part of what the Biden team has inherited. You see Jake Sullivan is already you know, personally very significantly involved in a lot of the early cyber stuff. And then the election security and the, and the, and the you know, the, which is a whole other sort of aspect of all this. It's just the manipulation of our election systems. Um, enormous challenges ahead, Karen, for this administration. And, um, you know, what I'm 
what I'm pleased about is that I think they are at least on the cybersecurity piece so far, they're leaning in very aggressively. Um, and you know, there's obviously they got a lot on their plates right now, but it's uh, we have a lot of work to do. I mean, for those of us who are big advocates of this thing called the internet, we have a lot of work to do. What's your general sense? If I can ask a few questions, then we'll. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What's your general sense about the legislative landscape? Um, you know, in terms of, I know you talked to a lot of folks. You're a former Senate staffer, uh, in addition to being a White House, you know, a, an administration staffer. What's your sense about what you think is possible? Um, over the next couple of years on the agenda that you laid out? If I just look at how the administration is starting out, I think the first thing they're trying to do is use the bully pulpit of the presidency to get factual information out. I love those dry COVID um, presentations that they do. You know, they're informative. They feel to me like FDR's fireside chats, you know, on the radio where the, he would say to people, get out your map. Let me explain to you where we are in the war and what's going on in this battle. I get, that's how I feel about these. Um, and I feel like that's so important that, that they use the bully pulpit to enforce, you know, authoritative information. And then, I don't know if you saw, but today they appointed this woman, Lena Khan, who's a big um, antitrust thinker and advocate, and they appointed Tim Wu earlier uh, this week. So clearly they're thinking that antitrust is um, an, uh, an important effort in all this. And then, um, you know, I think legislative, my sense about legislation is that Although there's a lot of interest in the Hill and there are a lot of bills, both, you know, that run the whole gamut, um, that as far as the administration goes, they have such so many other fish to fry that it may take a while to get there. And so I think in the meantime, there'll be sort of a sorting among the members. And what you see coming from a lot of Republicans is this sort of anti-bias stuff, which is, you know, this weird threat that they're going to take away Section 230, which allows platforms to moderate. Um, and then what you see on a lot of Democrats from a lot of Democrats is what do we do about this algorithm? How do we have more transparency? How do we enforce against civil rights violations online, uh, election interference, privacy? And where I guess it's going to shake out is if, if there's a real effort on a privacy bill, because so many states are taking action on privacy, um, maybe some of this stuff, maybe the stuff that rises to the top will get attached to the privacy bill. Yeah, I think um, there is, everybody wants to do something and it's gonna be interesting to see what it is that we, that we do. Um, I had one other, one other question. Um, I mean, what's your sense? You also are very involved in international conversations at the German Marshall Fund. You have many colleagues in Europe that are holding similar conversations. What's your sense of the global conversation around this and where is the US these days as we all try to navigate this all together? Yeah, I, I, I mean, that's a big part of what happened at the, or in the early days of the internet is the US was a real leader and the US hasn't been leading on either the cybersecurity or the disinformation or the privacy and uh, others have stepped in sometimes for good and sometimes for really not good. Um, so we need to step back into that leadership role. And I think both Jake Sullivan and Tony Blinken have indicated they want us to, and that they see a really essential role for the US with our democratic allies in figuring out a new framework and promoting it uh, and ensuring that authoritarians don't set the stage. On disinformation per se, Europe is really putting out a lot of proposals. They've put out three specifically, the Digital Services Act, something called the Democracy Action Plan, and then related this uh, Digital Markets Act on antitrust. And uh, if we wanna work closely with, with Europe as well as our other allies, I think we're gonna have to figure out what we wanna say yes to and embrace as part of an overall framework going forward. So I think the international context, you know, the internet is global. The international context is really important. And China's, you know, not up to great stuff. So we really have to, we, we have to step up. Karen, I've had this idea for many years that you and I have discussed about the idea of us needing in the US 
a surgeon general, you know, for the internet, you know, somebody who could be a trusted voice to talk to the American people about cyber hygiene and keeping you safe and how to deal with the idea that there are people who are trying to manipulate you and be somebody you, a trusted figure who could go on television and say, let me explain what this solar winds thing is and isn't, right? I mean, what's your sense of this? Because I, I do think this concept, and, and frankly, Jack Dorsey at Twitter and the Twitter team have been talking about this a lot, a lot is looking at a lot of the disinformation, misinformation challenges as, as something, you know, like a public health yeah. crisis, right? That there's an element of we need to keep ourselves safe, right? And and so what's your sense about that as a, a framework? And how, and when you talk about this, is that an effective way? To I ask? love that. I hadn't heard you say that. I love that idea. Um, you well, know, we can I think work on it like, together. We can work yeah, on it. No, I love it. Yeah, yeah. I think there's like two parts to this. So I've heard this analogy both to, and I've used it, both to public health and also to like pollution. And I think what's instructive about those analogies is that there's a personal aspect, you know, in public health and in and in you know the pollution environment or the you know climate, you know you want to recycle, you want to do hygiene, you want to take care of yourself. But then there's a public role, you know, that you can't do it yourself. You know, you can't recycle your way to get around global warming. Um, you can't, you know, if you wear a mask, that's not enough if nobody else does. So there is there is both this individual responsibility role, and then what we've neglected, I think, is the public leadership and hey, it can't all be choices. There have to be guardrails. And, um, you know, especially in, in what you were talking about, like doing your privacy protections or your cyber hygiene, it's just too much. Like there are too many choices. There are too many options. The transaction cost is too great. I mean, we're experts in my house and we have just, you know, it's a hell of a time to figure out all your privacy settings and keep up with all the changes. So I think the idea of, I mean, I think that's what we're gonna, we're gonna have to figure out is what is the role of the government? Because we don't, because the, in this area, free expression is so important. And we don't want to take that, we don't want to have the government involved in the truth police side of things. We don't want them doing that, right. nor do we want putting pressure on the companies to do that. But there are some common sense things. And so where I'm torn about your idea about the Surgeon General is I, I love it, but I also want to make sure that we're mainstreaming. Like, I think we both need to talk to people about the internet, but we also need to mainstream digital fluency in all aspects of government. So like HHS, as it's dealing with COVID and other public health issues, has to be thinking about disinformation and has to be thinking about getting its message out. And the FTC has to understand the internet and, you know, the transportation administration has to understand it. And so I don't want to, I don't want it to be an either or. I think we need to speak to the internet. But we also need to mainstream it. You know, last point, and then we'll open it up for questions is that I do think the, that the fact that there is now clear mis disinformation about the vaccines is a, a enormous opportunity to bring a broader community along in this conversation in the way that you are. Because now, if you're a private corporation in the United States, it's just inescapable that at some point, whether it's to manipulate your stock price, whether it's to play games, that you are now living in a world where disinformation is ripe. It's part of the uh, landscape that we all live in now. And here you have companies like uh, you know, Johnson & Johnson and Moderna and Pfizer who are now confronting attacks on their brands by nation states, right? That could have enormous impact, not just on the vaccine, but on their global businesses, right? Yeah. That they are gonna have to manage. And so do you think this is gonna be an opportunity for us to expand this conversation to a much broader audience because of what we're going through with the vaccines now? It has to be. And that's one area I think on cybersecurity, we've had such a hard time. You know, what's what are we just leaving companies on their own to deal with? Um, and where does the government come in? How, what kind of information sharing, uh, you know, in what kind of privacy protected way can there be? And now it's spread into the disinformation space, but absolutely that we can't just leave these companies on their own. And, and the, in the vaccine space, it's especially clear because there's this public health component to it. Um, but it's true, you know, in an even broader sense than that, you know, um, the critical industry uh, infrastructure, but just any big. I mean, when you think about the Sony hack and how damaging that was, or um, 
you know, so many of the others, they, they exact a huge toll. So, okay, so let's uh, open it up, everybody. Thanks, Karen. Um, we've got, you know, 10, 15 minutes if you want. There's two ways to ask a question. One is you can go into the Q&A box at the bottom, type away, I'll read it out. Or if you want to raise your hand, I can call on you. And, um, and I do, we do have a first question, Karen, from an old friend, uh, Chris Dorval. Um, can you talk a little bit more about states that are leading the way or things they can realistically do on what is ultimately a national issue? Yeah, um, yeah, the states are actually really active. So California, of course, has passed this privacy law that sort of they based it on GDPR, but did things really differently. And um, it's, uh, it's really setting, you know, standards in some ways for the rest of the country. Uh, Virginia um, is following suit. So I, I think I think there's a lot that's going on that's really interesting in terms of privacy. Um, some of the states are looking at, at the political ads, uh, some First Amendment issues, so it's going back and forth. Um, facial recognition uh, is being considered in a lot of states and localities. And, um, and as I said, in some of the red states, there's this big move to punish platforms if they do any moderating at all. So not such a good thing. Um, so, I mean, I think the most interesting things have to do with privacy, just because that's sort of the furthest along and thinking about how a lot of this stuff works together. Like, what do you include in the privacy uh, bucket? Um, so I, I think that's the most interesting, but I think the stuff that hasn't really been explored enough is you know, what is consumer fraud? What is consumer protect? What is con protected under consumer protection laws? What is, you know, a violation of a civil rights law when it happens online? What is voter suppression? So I think a lot of that stuff is going to be worked out um, going forward. And some of that can be done at the state and local levels. Hi, Chris. <laughs> Garrett, let me, uh, let me call on you here, Garrett. Hey, welcome, Garrett. Um, hold on. I think you're unmuted, Garrett. Go ahead. Um, hi. Um, so um, I, I was the founder of, of what's now called Ask.com. It was then called Ask Jeeves. Um, and was it, it, it reviewed the, could have invested in the social media generation of companies and chose not to around these concerns. Oh, wow. And I want to say that um, I agree with you on the privacy um, uh, you know, the privacy is, uh, it, to many extent, the root of a lot of this. And there, I think we have a lot of agreement. But, um, and, you know, my mother always said, don't listen to anything before the but. Um, the, but, you know, if you, if you look back in history, the, the um, a much more significant thing than the internet was the advent of radio. And with radio came information viruses that were much worse than anything we have seen. I think Hitler was the virus of radio. Um, and, um, you know, now we are dealing with the viruses of social media. And while I do believe Facebook is a bad actor, what I think is, um, you know, the question is, how do we develop antibodies to the proclivities of social media without violating First Amendment rights? And it strikes me that it's very hard to put in place a regulatory regime that goes beyond where we are with respect to physical media or radio or television um, that doesn't violate First Amendment uh, uh, rights. And your own example, frankly, is, is a damn good one of it, is that you know, um, it's perfectly okay for people in Texas to say that, you know, that they think that investments in, um, in renewable energy relate to their energy problems. I think that they're wrong, but um, you know, it would take a science court to determine that. And I don't think a science court right now, even now could make that call. Um, the, you know, it's a very complex multi-dimensional thing. And our, our politics are all about it precisely, and they're crude, you know, but that's the necessary, it's the necessary elements of, of, of democracy to, to grapple with things of this sort. Yeah. So anyway, uh, that was a very long-winded saying, no, how no. concerned are you about the so, uh, 
the First Amendment aspects of this. Oh, so very. And so I'm really glad you asked that question. No, I'm really glad you asked that question because I think I try to compress it and lose some of the nuance. And so you've, uh, I really appreciate that question. So the reason I talk about the pipeline is what I'm trying to say is the First Amendment questions arise if you say the government or the platform has to decide on the, on the claim and the content. Like if the government had to decide, oh, this article is right or wrong, or the platform had to decide this article is right or wrong and then act to take it down, that's problematic. I mean, it, we make them, you know, in, in some cases they wanna do that, like if it's dangerous and it's incitement to violence. But what I'm saying is, if you look at the repeat offenders that make up the pipeline, then the platforms could take some action, not necessarily to take down those aspects, but to not allow them to deceive users as easily and not allow them to amplify as much when it's dangerous. So what do I mean? So you have these outlets that um, uh, are huge, you know, have much bigger um, reach than you can possibly imagine that have been growing exponentially online in their reach. And they get that, they're, they're really websites that NewsGuard, which is this independent rating organization has said a bunch of them either fail their criteria for repeatedly publishing false content, or they have another category that says they gather and present information irresponsibly, uh, meaning they'll like stick a headline on, on an article that has nothing to do with it, what's in the article. And a bunch of these outlets, um, the way they grow their, their audiences is by um, coordinating with these pages that push their stuff out and they pay them through the, you know, back door, um, or they use false, um, uh, accounts to push their stuff and they're, the platforms know who they are. They're, you know, there are 10 of them that, you know, dominate the rest, the top, you know, the top 10 and various categories. And they, I'm not saying they should take them down, but they should pay attention and um, they may not want to amplify. And the way you deal with that is you don't say that the government should tell the platforms to do that. What I'm saying is the role of the government is just enforce like our consumer protection laws and our civil rights laws and our campaign finance laws. As we've designed them offline, let's figure out how to, how to protect those online. But this stuff that we're talking about that's more First Amendment protected where it's harmful, but it's not illegal, there the platforms need to come together and develop some kind of code of conduct, just like we talked about in the early days of the internet. And they need to sort of tie their hands by being really making transparent public commitments of what they're gonna do. And then they can do things like deal with these repeat offenders. So I'm sorry, I didn't mean to blab on for so long, but it's kind of complicated and nuanced. And the one other thing I'll say, and then I'll shut up Simon is, if you compare it to broadcast and radio, we're actually doing much less than we did for broadcast and radio. And we, we can't do as much as we did for broadcast and radio because broadcast and radio were using public airwaves. And so there we, the, the courts developed a loophole in the first amendment that they used to regulate radio and broadcast TV where they said, because they're using the public airwaves, we can regulate them in the public interest. There's no such loophole for, for social media. So social media, has much less government involvement and always will, much less regulation ever will. Um, so in radio, for instance, you had the rule that if it was an advertisement, you know, it was being paid for, you had to uh, reveal that, you know, you had the fairness doctrine, you had a whole bunch of stuff, um, not, a lot of it not really good. But you also developed in the broadcast era and newspapers developed this, codes of conduct for how, for the, for how they were going to treat news. And we, we haven't had that, those private codes of conduct for how we're going to represent the public interest that arose, a lot of that arose after the bad example of Hitler. And how are we not gonna be used to be propagandists? So. Let me, um, Karen, let me jump in and thanks Garrett um, for uh, one more uh, question and comment. This is from Gil Ruiz, uh, who works with Senator Gillibrand, who said, do we need an independent agency dedicated to tech and individual privacy? I know this is something you've talked about, Karen. Senator Gillibrand has introduced legislation to establish this and Senator Brown's proposal, the data proposal, to create a comprehensive privacy laws, including a uh, DPA as well. This has been argued by Tom Wheeler, Gene Kimmelman, 
and Phil Revere and the new digital realities proposal. Um, Want to have any quick reaction to that? I know this is something you've spent time talking about. Yeah, yeah. I've also, I also, I go back and forth. We, uh, Ellen Goodman and I actually prepared, uh, proposed something like that in Democracy Journal. Um, but I go back and forth because, again, I don't want to fall into this trap, but I don't think any of us want to that Garrett was talking about. I'm looking like we want a ministry of truth. And I think that's what people hear when they hear about an internet agency. Um, and I also, the other issue I have with it is just what we were talking about with Simon, with the Surgeon General. We want to have, uh, you know, uh, expertise in the government that's focused on this and leading, but it also has to be mainstreamed in the other um, you know, we all conduct all of our lives on the internet. Um, any part of government should be expert bilingual in effect uh, in digital. So I think you could go either way. I think the chances of our creating a new agency right now are very minimal. So I think we'd be better off paying attention to how to integrate it into what we already do. And let me, let me just, my last comment I want to make is that, you know, I, I worked at the DCCC as a senior advisor in 2018 I was in the war room back in the stone age of modern political communications. And one of the things that we did in 2018 as part of the countering disinformation operation that I helped run was that it, we became aware of the need for us to be louder. And then I think that every brand and every politician and every institution is going to have to take also a degree of responsibility for recognizing that there are forces out there who are manipulating their, the world that they inhabit and that they need to um, be louder every day and just culturally louder, right? We have to be louder to help make it harder for these forces to manipulate us, right? And we have to develop tools, as Karen was saying, that every institution has to sort of also do some policing of their own space. I mean, one of the things that we did in 2018 when we were there is that we found malicious actors and we reported it to the platforms and the platforms did a lot of takedowns and you know we they wanted they were incentivized to do takedowns with us because we could regulate them but we also took responsibility for monitoring our space and trying to clean it up right in addition to not expecting government to do it too. And so I do think that there is, this is why I like the concept of a Surgeon General in some ways, or this idea that there's things government can do, the companies can do, but there's a lot we can do too, to make all this better and to not feel so powerless uh, by, and, and so, because I think so much of what happens when I talk to people is they feel overwhelmed. They feel like this is so much bigger than they are. There's nothing they can do. And that's just not true, right? There's a lot we can all do, as you were saying with privacy, for example, but we need help and we need people setting examples. We need to learn together how to, you know, we, we learn how not to go to walk down a dark street in a city. I mean, there are things that we can learn how to do together to make ourselves and keep ourselves safe on the internet. And I think this concept of safety Yes. And um, is really, really important, right? And, and so Karen, let me tee that up to you to close and, and to give us final thoughts. And you've been terrific today. Thank you for, for being part of this. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I don't want anybody to walk away thinking, uh, thinking that we in any way should protect, the, protect folks on the internet by um, harming free expression. Um, I think that's exactly what the challenge is. How do we do that? in a way that promotes free expression. Um, I love the idea of safety. And in fact, the UK is leading with that. That's how they talk about this. Um, I think that's really, really helpful. And, um, you know, I think we all have a lot to do to unpack this. I think there's been, um, you know, the same impulse that led to tech utopianism has us talking about this in an all encompassing way that doesn't let us solve it. And I think we need to pick it apart and realize that no other sector of the economy do we think there's gonna be one quick fix and there's not going to be. Um, so, you know, I love the idea of a surgeon general. I love the idea of, um, you know, better labeling. I like the idea of a circuit breaker. I like the idea of Honest Ads Act. There are a lot of things that we need to do to clean up this space. We've spent way too long um, sort of hoping uh, Mark Zuckerberg would clean it up by himself. I agree. Uh, now we're hoping, a lot of people think, oh, we're going to get rid of Section 230 and that's magically going to fix everything. There's no magic fix. I think we have to all become more, 
you know, as, as policy aficionados, we have to roll up our sleeves and realize there are a bunch of fixes. And then as citizens, as Simon is saying, there's a bunch of stuff we need to do as well. So thanks for, for building on this conversation, Simon. Karen, thank you as always. I think this could go on for hours. Um, you know, this is really important stuff. And I think that so much of this conversation under Trump was so stupid that, you know, we are so much of what Biden is going to be doing for us, as you said in, the, in your comments earlier, is just establishing some uh, a, rea a framework around reality for the next six months so that we can once again start to reestablish a shared reality where we can have productive conversations. Um, you know, it's hard when 40% of the country is operating in a completely different information system than we are to be able to have, you know, uh, thoughtful debate and discussion. But I do think that this area is an area that's rife for um, uh, enlightened public leadership in creating a new vocabulary and language and theory of how we even talk about this. We've got work to do here. And as you said, we I don't think we have common framework, common language yet to describe it. I, as a dad of three teenagers, I will tell you that there's an urgency to all of this because it is amazing how much uh, stuff just wanders into their world uh, that you know is we're having to beat back and to talk about the untruth of it. And and this is where I do think that part of Trump's legacy is that he left a very polluted or damaged, broken, debilitated information environment, a lot of distrust of authority and institutions that's going to take a long time to, to, to rebuild. And, and it's, a, you know, this is a very important area. Um, as always, Karen, I'm super grateful for your thought leadership of, you know, you can follow Karen on Twitter. She's also at the German Marshall Fund. She writes prolifically. She's on all these kinds of Zooms all the time from her uh, well-appointed bookcase uh, living room where she is now. And uh, so thanks, Karen, for being with us. And thanks, everybody. Um, our next two events are Friday at 2. We have our weekly showing of With Democrats, Things Get Better, which is my sort of sustained meditation on the success of the center left in American politics over the last generation. And then next Tuesday, we have Rob Shapiro, an old friend who will be talking about the American Rescue Plan, which by then will be law, uh, we hope, uh, and is obviously landmark legislation that all of us have to do a lot to sort of come to understand it because it's big and it's ambitious and it's really important. So we'll have a great session with Rob next Tuesday. Karen, thanks, stay in touch. Thanks everybody.